Stone Brothers Production. Hello, welcome back. This is part two of the Serial Killer series in Florida episode. Hit that like button and subscribe if you're a new user, but let's get right into the episode. This is seven infamous serial killers in Florida, so let's begin. Number seven, Daytona Beach Serial Killer. The Daytona Beach Serial Killer is an unidentified serial killer who slayed between four to seven people in the Daytona Beach area whose murders have never been solved. The first victim being Laquetta Gunther, who was found in the back of an alleyway in Ridgewood Avenue. She had been shot in the back of the head and DNA evidence was recovered from the scene. The second victim, Julia Green, was found a month or less later and had been shot in the back of the head also. No DNA evidence was recovered from the scene, but tire tracks were found belonging to a 2003 Taurus or Sable. A third victim was found just over a month later, where they found the body of Awana Patton, a 35-year-old black woman, was found dead. This time, detectives found more DNA evidence, and the shell casing that allowed police to identify it belonged to a 40 caliber Smith & Wesson Sigma Series VE. The caller who found the body was questioned, but not a suspect in the killings. All the three victims believed they were sex workers and visited the same bar called Willie's. Stacy Gaggy, a 30-year-old white woman, was the fourth victim found years later, and she had been shot in the back of the head as well. Unlike the first three women, she did not have a criminal record involving prostitution, but she did have a history of drug abuse. She left one night to the grocery store and never showed up, and all four women were suspected to be killed by the same unidentified fugitive. They also believe the killer killed three other women in different ways, but cannot fully tie the serial killer to the murders because they died in different fashion, but around the same vicinity off of I-4 Daytona Highway. They believe the suspect was a motorist fitting the profile of a white male with a girlfriend. Police believe him to still be out at large, but they hope he isn't dead so they can finally close a decade-long case when they find him. Number 6. Rory Enrique Condi As a child, Condi's mother died when he was 6 years old and he lived with his grandmother until the age of 12 years old. Condi then moved to live with his father in Miami where he was abused by his father. He was abusive to his wife because of the results of that and went on to disappear killing prostitutes. Also, Condi threatened to kill his wife if she dated anyone else and they moved to a condo near his future dumping grounds for the prostitutes. Condi was given the nickname Tom Miami Trail Strangler because it was his dumping grounds for the bodies along the final section of Highway 41 which goes from Tampa to Miami. Six victims died to the hands of Condi, first being a cross-dressing male prostitute, Lazaro Camasana. His body was found the same year on September 16, 1994, which he was strangled to death and dumped on a roadside by Highway 41. Condi mentioned he killed him because he found out he was a male during sex. Condi then killed two more prostitutes, one being Alyssa Martinez on October 8, 1994, and Charity Nava on November 20, 1994. On the back and buttocks of the third victim being Charity, he wrote, Third, I will call Dwight Chan 10 and see if you can catch me. Dwight Chan 10 in regards to WPLG anchor Dwight Lauderdale. Condi then killed three more prostitutes in the same fashion, which were Wanda Crawford on November 25, 1994, Nicole Schneider on December 17, 1994, and his final victim, Rhonda Dunn, on January 12, 1995. Condi's method of killing was strangling to death, and then he would have anal sexual intercourse with the corpses afterward. Condi was arrested on June 19, 1995, when Gloria Mastre, a prostitute that he had bound head to toe, and made enough noise to attract neighbors while Condi was in court for a shoplifting charge. Rory Condi was sentenced to death on March 7, 2000 for the murder of Rhonda Dunn and later pleaded guilty for five other murders to get five consecutive life sentences without parole on April 5, 2001. Number 5. Paul DeRusso, aka the Jacksonville Serial Killer. DeRusso was a man born to unwed parents in Viewmount, Texas. DeRusso and his older brother Joseph moved to Los Angeles to be raised by their mother and her family. At the age of 19, DeRusso became a security guard after graduating from Reseda High School in the Los Angeles area. Two years later, in a month's span, he was arrested for carrying a concealed weapon on December 1991 and then again on January 1992 and receiving three years of probation. About 10 months later, Paul enlisted in the army rather than marrying a woman that he got pregnant and he was stationed in Germany. Paul married a woman in 1995 and re-enlisted in the Army where he was stationed at Fort Benning, Georgia in 1996. 
In Georgia is where Paul started his rape tendencies that got him several charges, but was acquitted of them in a court martial. He also had two children around this point in 1997. His wife had enough of his abusive ways and moved down to Jacksonville, Florida, and Paul followed them also to Florida. He was also discharged from the Army for buying stolen computer equipment from the military base in 1999 when he was only 29 years old. At this point in Paul's life, he was desperate to do anything to make money, including robbing and working as a school bus driver somehow after all his rape charges and allegations. He always somehow slid by with lower reduced charges, but didn't become so lucky after not attending many meetings for the psychosexual counseling, which led investigators to arrest him and build a case on him. He was in connection with five murders that had his DNA at the crime scenes for each woman. They say he worked for a taxi cab driver, committing most of his murders and meeting them in social situations. They say Paul swayed a lot of women to have sex with him. Every woman he had killed were all raped and killed with a cord of some kind, most of them being extension cords from TVs being cut. Every woman he assaulted were single black females, two being pregnant and most of them being killed in their own homes at the time. He also had assaulted most of them in their homes other than three. Tracy Habersham being found nude in Fort Benning after leaving a party, the other two women being found at a construction site in a ditch under leaves. Both names were Giovanna Jefferson and Sarita Cohen. He was also charged with child neglect charges because of two children being left with their mother's body being extremely malnourished. His main charge was for Teresa Mack as they had the most evidence for her case and many eyewitnesses linking him to the crime. Paul was sentenced to death by lethal injection for the murder of Teresa Mack, but eventually was overturned by the Florida Supreme Court on January 2017. Paul is one of the many men who thought all their confidence would never get them arrested for their brutal crimes, but in the end, law enforcement prevails, but only to some extent for the justice system. Number 4. William Lindsay, aka Crazy Bill Lindsay was born on March 18, 1935 to parents of an unknown origin. I say unknown because both of his parents died in a car wreck on the side of the road, and the Lindsay family adopted him around the same time they lost their own child. His adopted parents didn't favor him so well because they found out he gained inheritance 20 years later and expected him to pay back the debt for living in their home. He left their home 28 miles from Paletka, working at Hudson Pulp and Paper Corporation. Two years later, when he was 23, he married the love of his life, Willa Jean, and they had a daughter together, Beverly, shortly after their marriage. After his marriage, William joined the National Guard and became heavily addicted to alcohol and began to beat his wife. He became addicted to other drugs during this time and he went to a psychiatric hospital and writing a seven page long suicide note to his wife in 1974. Around this time he was 39 years old and he was released and took five of his children for a drive and wrecked his car. All of his children were hurt and three of them were hospitalized for the injury. He then was divorced soon after and somehow got in custody of his children for convincing the courts that his soon-to-be ex-wife suffered from a mental health issue. He had gotten remarried to Annie Langley, who also took the same abuse from him, and her sister witnessed his abusive nature after she lived with both of them. Around this time is when he decided to start his murderous raping acts on prostitutes. First to be noted was Lisa Foley, who vanished on October 9, 1983 after a night of drinking at the Tradewinds Lounge in downtown St. Augustine. She was killed because she started an argument for why he only paid her $50 when she asked for $300. She was strangled to death and tossed in a marshy area off West End Pope Road in St. Augustine. Second to be slain was Anita McQuig who was found with her eye socket crushed and her jaw fractured in two places from being hit by a three foot long piece of board and was tossed in a pond around the same area in St. Augustine. She also had bite marks and cigarette burns on her body. Third on the list was Connie Terrell, who was strangled with a rope and shot in the head with a 22 caliber weapon. Her nude body was discovered 12 hours later by a fisherman and William tossed her clothes in the San Sebastian Creek on his way back home. Lashana Streeter and Cher Lucas were his fourth and fifth victims. Streeter was beaten to death because she allegedly tried to rob him and her body was found 10 days later from an area residence called Quinney's Land. Lucas was picked up and apparently she stole his cash, which William did not favor, so he chased her down and crushed her skull in with a pry bar. Her body was found by boaters several days later at a Moultrie Creek boat ramp. For his final victim, he confessed most of them were beaten unconscious and thrown into a creek and drowned to death, and some were murdered in other manners. He was charged with 6-7 to seven confirmed slangs but exceeded to 20 victims, which were acquired from multiple sources. 
He plea bargained his death sentence for 30 years in prison but died in prison on April 17, 2001. Number 3. Otis Toole, aka the Jacksonville Cannibal. Toole was born and raised in Jacksonville, Florida. Toole's mother was a religious fanatic and Toole claimed that she abused him, including that she dressed him up in women's clothing, calling him Becky. As a young child, Toole was a victim of incest by the hands of many close relatives, including his older sister and next door neighbor. His grandmother was a Satanist who exposed him to various satanic practices and rituals in his youth. Also, Toole was included in self-mutilation, grave robbing, and dubbed him as the devil's child. He suffered from mild mental retardation with an IQ of 75, but his IQ would probably be higher if he didn't suffer from various learning disabilities. Throughout his childhood, he ran away from home sleeping in abandoned homes. Also, Toole was a serial arsonist at a young age, and he was aroused by fire. He knew he was a homosexual at 10 years old and would support himself being a prostitute in his teens dressing up in drag. Toole claimed to have committed his first murder at the age of 14 by running over a traveling salesman with his own car after propositioning for sex. Not much information is known about Toole from 1966 to 1973, but it is believed that he was drifting around the southwestern United States and supporting himself with prostitution and panhandling. While he was living in Nebraska, he was a prime suspect in the 1974 murder of 24-year-old Patricia Webb and shortly after he left Nebraska to Boulder, Colorado briefly. He was a prime suspect in another murder a month later for the murder of Ellen Holman, who was murdered on October 14, 1974 with many accusations against him, so Toole left Boulder and headed back to Jacksonville. In 1976, Toole met up with fellow serial killer Henry Lee Lucas at a Jacksonville soup kitchen and developed a sexual relationship with him. Toole later claimed to have helped Lucas in 108 murders, which Lucas claimed to have killed over 3,000 people. On January 4, 1982, Toole barricaded 64-year-old George Sonnenberg in his boarding house in Jacksonville and set the house on fire. Sonnenberg survived the house fire but died a week later due to the injuries he sustained from the fire. In April 1983, Toole was arrested for an unrelated arson crime in Jacksonville and for that crime he received 20 years in prison. While in custody, he confessed to killing Sonnenberg back in 1982 and had a sexual relationship with him. He said after he had two arguments with Sonnenberg, he lit his home on fire. Two months later, in June of 1983, his partner Lucas was arrested and Lucas mentioned about the murderous rampage he committed with the duo serial killers together. Lucas backed Toole's confession about one of his more prolific murders of six-year-old Adam Walsh, but a few weeks later after Toole's confession, police mentioned they had lost his impound car and machete. He wasn't convicted of that murder at that time, but many years later after his death, in 2008, Hollywood, Florida police announced Toole as the murderer to close the case even though police still had no DNA evidence. During the trial for murdering George Sonnenberg, Toole lied and said he didn't set his home on fire and signed a confession so he would be extradited back to Jacksonville. On April 28, 1984, a jury found Toole guilty of first-degree murder of Sonnenberg and sentenced him to death. Tool received his second death sentence later that year for murdering a 19-year-old woman in Tallahassee, Florida back in February of 1983, but on an appeal, both death sentences were commuted to life in prison. In 1991, during his incarceration, Tool pleaded guilty to four more murders in Jacksonville and received four more life sentences. On September 15, 1996, at the age of 49, Otis Tool died in his prison cell from liver failure, and he was buried in a prison cemetery because no one claimed his body. Number 2. Gerald Eugene Stoneau Stoneau was born in Schenectady, New York, and his name given at birth was Paul Zeininger. His biological mother neglected him so much that county doctors declared him unadoptable because they said he was functioning at an animalistic level, even ingesting his own feces to survive. However, he was eventually adopted by Norma Stoneau, a nurse who renamed him to Gerald Eugene Stoneau. Stoneau's adoptive parents were loving parents, but discipline problems plagued their adopted son all his life. He would earn C's and D's in all his subjects in school except music, which he excelled at. Stoneau lied all the time to his parents, in which he was caught stealing money from his father's wallet to pay fellow members of the track and field team to finish behind him so he wouldn't be viewed as a failure. Stoneau described killing 41 women in Florida, Pennsylvania, and New Jersey, even though police say the number might be closer to 80 women. He received the death penalty for killing Kathy Lee Scarf, a 17-year-old hitchhiker for Port Orange, Florida, which her body was found in an isolated area of Brevard County, Florida. 
She was fatally stabbed between December of 1973 to January 1974. Snow so Compessity choked the girl repeatedly, stabbed her to death, and dumped her body in a drainage ditch before cleaning up and going roller skating. Most of his victims were prostitutes, runaways, and teenagers. Stano confessed to murdering Mary Carol Maher. When he asked to describe her, he stood up to give her height, weight by gesture, and describe her being tall and athletic. He described what she was wearing too, making it very accurate for what she looked like. Stano also confessed to the murder of Tony Van Haddix, and she had been a missing person from Daytona Beach, Florida. Her body was found in Volusia County on April 6, 1980 in an area where Stano used to live. Detectives found similarities between her and Maher, both being covered with branches and similar wounds. He even remembered the details that the police did not know of, for instance he stated that she had a cast on her arm. Stano blamed his mother for the anger he had towards women. Stano had 22 confirmed murders he was charged with and during the sentencing phase he had 6 life sentences for 6 women and 3 death sentences for 3 more in 1983. While on death row, he was housed with fellow serial killer Ted Bundy until his execution in 1989. Before being executed on March 23, 1998, he wrote in his final statement that he proclaimed innocence and directly blames his false confession at the lead investigator Paul Crow. He mentioned Detective Paul Crow spoon-feeding him details of the unsolved homicides. After his execution in late 2007, an FBI lab report surfaced that Sano could not have been the unidentified pubic hairs that were covered from Scarf's body. The evidence of that murder was destroyed after his execution to make you think if it was a setup. Number 1 Theodore Robert Bundy Ted Bundy was born in Burlington, Vermont to an unwed mother, which his father was a mystery, but she told him later that she was seduced by a war veteran named Jack Worthington. I'm going to skip over Bundy's early life because there was so much information on him, so I'd rather talk about his crime and murder spree that followed in the early to mid-1970s. Bundy expressed really long resentment towards his mother for never mentioning about his real father and for leaving him to discover the truth for himself. While on death row, he mentioned since he was a young age he was fascinated by sex and violence. Even mentioning while in his teens, he would look at books on crime, focusing on sources that describe sexual violence with pictures of dead bodies and violent sexuality. He went to the University of Washington and graduated with a degree in psychology, and went to work with the state Republican Party, which he developed a close relationship with Governor Daniel J. Evans. Bundy went to enroll in the University of Utah, then met up with his ex-girlfriend from Washington College in California of summer of 1973, and then he went back with her. He dumped his girlfriend after New Year's in 1974, two weeks after he proposed to her, and then he dropped out of college in spring of 1974 after doing poorly skipping classes. He began his murderous rampage in Washington State a few weeks after dumping his girlfriend. No one exactly knows where and when Bundy started his killings, but many Bundy experts believe he started in his early teens. The day before his execution in Florida, he mentioned he committed his first attempt at kidnapping of a woman in 1969 and implied that he committed his first actual murder sometime in 1972. Bundy's earliest known identified murders were committed in 1974 when he was 27 years old. Shortly after midnight on January 4, 1974, Bundy entered the basement bedroom of 18-year-old Joni Lenz, who was a dancer and student at University of Washington. She was bashed with a metal rod from her bed frame while she was asleep and sexually assaulted her with a speculum. Lenz was discovered the next morning by a roommate lying in a pool of her own blood in a coma. She survived the attack but suffered permanent brain damage. Coeds began disappearing at a rate of roughly one a month. On March 12, 1974 in Olympia, Bundy kidnapped and murdered Donna Gail Manson, a 19-year-old student at Evergreen State College. He continued with his killing spree in Washington until July 14, 1974 of daytime abduction of Janice Ott and Denise Naslin from Lake Sammamish State Park in Issaca. Many witnesses told King County detectives about the suspect being a young handsome man with his left arm in a sling who called himself Ted mentioning about helping him with unloading his sailboat from his beetle. A few witnesses saw Ott with Ted walking away from the beach in his company and disappeared. Police received 200 tips per day and a former co-worker, girlfriend, and one of his professors at the University of Washington after seeing a sketch of him on the news, mentioning him as a possible suspect. Fragmented remains of both Ott and Nasland were both discovered on September 7, 1974 off of Interstate 90 near Essica, one mile from the park. 
While attending law school in Utah, he resumed killing again in October of 1974, which Nancy Wilcox disappeared from Holiday, Utah, on October 2, 1974. She was last seen riding in a Volkswagen Beetle. Ted Bundy continued to murder, attempted murder, and kidnapping of many women in Utah and then in Colorado in 1975, until his arrest on August 16, 1975 in Salt Lake City, Utah, after failing to stop for a police officer. When they searched his vehicle, the car revealed a ski mask, a crowbar, handcuffs, trash bags, an ice pick, and other items that were suspected from police being burglary tools. He remained calm during questioning and he said he needed the mask for skiing and he found handcuffs in a dumpster. Detectives connected Bundy's Volkswagen Beetle to a kidnapping of missing girls in Durant and searched his apartment. The search uncovered a brochure of Colorado ski resorts with a checkmark by Wildwood Inn where victim Karen Campbell was last seen. Bundy was convicted of a Durant kidnapping on March 1st, 1976 and was sentenced to 15 years in Utah State Prison. On June 7, 1977, while preparing for a hearing in a murder trial of Karen Campbell, Bundy was taken to the Pitkin County Courthouse in Aspen, Colorado. During a court recess, he was allowed to visit the courthouse law library, where he escaped jumping out of a second-story window, spraining his ankle. Bundy was caught after only six days on the run on June 13, 1977, being pulled over in a stolen vehicle he found on the Aspen Mountain. Bundy made another escape plan by getting a saw blade from another inmate and $500 in cash smuggled over a six month period. He sawed a hole about one foot square between steel bars and a cell ceiling. After losing 35 pounds, he was able to fit through and make practice runs in the week followed. On the night of December 30th of 1977, most of the jail staff was on Christmas break and Bundy put books underneath his blanket to make it look like he was sleeping and then he climbed through the ceiling hole to break into the chief of jail's apartment. He then wore regular street clothes he found there and walked out the front door to freedom. Bundy left Colorado to multiple states by train, bus, and car, finally arriving to Tallahassee, Florida on the morning of January 8, 1978. In the early hours of January 15, 1978, one week after his arrival in Tallahassee, Bundy went inside an FSU Chai Omega sorority house through the back door. Beginning at around 2.45 a.m., Bundy bashed Margaret Bowman, age 21, with a piece of firewood as she was sleeping, and then strangled her with a nylon stocking. He then entered a room across from Bowman's room to 20-year-old Lisa Levy. Bundy beat her unconscious, strangled her, tore one of her nipples, bit hard on her left buttock, and sexually assaulted her with a hair mist bottle. Both Levy and Bowman died from the attack. Bundy then went into another room of Kathy Kleiner, breaking her jaw and deeply lacerating her shoulder. Then he went into Karen Chandler's room, which she suffered a concussion, broken jaw, loss of teeth, and a crushed finger. Detectives in the area determined that the four attacks took no more than 30 minutes, and 30 witnesses in hearing distance heard nothing at all. Bundy broke into another home a few blocks away, bashing and severely injuring a Florida State student, Cheryl Thomas. Nearly a month later, on February 9, 1978, Bundy traveled to Lake City, Florida. While there, he kidnapped, raped, and murdered 12-year-old Kimberly Leach, tossing her body under a small pig shed. On February 15, 1978, a little after 1 a.m., Bundy was stopped by a Pensacola police officer named David Lee. The officer saw that the vehicle came up stolen in his computer, and he scuffled with Bundy after he saw him trying to escape, but then he arrested him. Lee didn't know it was Bundy, and Bundy said, I wish you had killed me. After identifying him in the jail system, he was transported to Tallahassee, and he was charged with three murders in Tallahassee and Lake City. On July 24, 1979, Bundy received two death sentences for the murders of Bowman and Levy, three counts of attempted first-degree murder, and two counts of burglary. Bundy got his third death sentence on February 10, 1980 for the murder of Kimberly Leach. Ted Bundy's defense attorney claimed that he confessed to murdering 30-plus women in seven states before he was executed by electric chair on January 24, 1979. FBI agents believe that 35 is the estimate. No one will ever know the estimate number, but the states he murdered in were Washington, Utah, Colorado, Florida, Idaho, California, and Oregon. I hope you enjoyed the video. Next date on our list is Georgia. Once again, subscribe, like, and click the bell below the video so you get notified on the next episode. I hope you all have a great rest of your day, and I'll see you on the next episode.